Uh, somewhere in a not very impressive part of the universe, the planet called Earth revolves around the sun, which is not a very impressive star, right? And we are in some, but we are lucky enough to be here because we are in something which is called as the Goldilocks zone. You know, it's neither too hot, it's neither too cold, it's just right. And that's what breeds life on this beautiful planet. But when you come down to the geography, what we live in, and not very far from here, and I'm sure something which all of us deal with in our daily lives, is something like this. This is an artist's impression of when you come down the ONGC flyover in Bandar Kurla, and this was something about day before yesterday. You know, you will find uh, the roads were flooded, uh, there was traffic stalled here for around 45 minutes because of the multiple potholes which were there. And coincidentally, there were people trying to repair the potholes while the cars, early morning traffic, people going to work, right? Uh, there seems to be an abundant amount of chaos in our daily lives in some form, whether it's on commute, whether it's in our lives, whether it's the hectic ac activity that's bustling around us. But in spite of that, there seems to exist a very fine sense of order in the city. You know, just to recapitulate some few facts, in spite of chaos everywhere, Mumbai still displays a large sense of order on the macro level. It contributes very, very largely to India's economy, has one of the largest stock exchanges in the world, uh, delivers 200,000 meals. You know, this is a mind-boggling fact. There's a, the Dabbawala service has an error rate of 1 in 16 million. And this was a study which was done by Howard Medical School, not us, right? Howard University, I'm sorry. Uh, over 7 million passengers commute on over 2,000 railway services, and which is silent only for 90 minutes of the day. It's off from, I think, 2 o'clock in the morning till 3.30 in the morning, and then we're back on track. And we have one of the busiest airports in the world now, with more than 40 million passengers, uh, uh, you know, traveling and taking around 300,000 flights on an annual basis. Now, this is where I like to move from here into a bizarre science, which I have been fortunate enough to stumble across over the last 2-3 years, purely by interest. I am not a subject matter expert on it, but I do find it very, very interesting. And I was able to find some amazing parallels with our lives. Uh, you know, order from disorder is something which was quoted by a gentleman called Erwin Schrodinger, and one of the most brilliant minds of, uh, you know, recent times. In around, it was in the early 40s when he came out with this, uh, he posited that phys uh, all physical beings at the highest level uh, that is at the macroscopic level, they display a large sense of order uh, because there is a huge amount of chaos happening at smaller scales. You know? And that's exactly what Mumbai city was all about. There is a large sense of order, there's a fine line of beauty which runs through. The city never stops, we always keep saying that. There's always something which is on the trot. We keep moving, we keep going. Uh, even in spite of rains, the city never stops, the buses never stand still, they keep moving on, there's always transport. Uh, but in spite of that, all of our lives, I guess, are exemplary of the chaos that uh, exists around us. Uh, taking in that, you know, and then if I try to compare that with quantum physics and moving a little bit into the quantum realm, which is nothing but the study of particles at really, really nanoscopic levels, uh, there seems to be interesting parallels with our life. And that's what I'm going to try and present to you shortly. You know, uh, it has been called bizarre, mysterious, funky, strange. So strange that one of the uh, people who incorporated uh, quantum physics into uh, the world, Albert Einstein, uh, you know, came out with these two very, uh, you know, diametrically opposite thoughts from special relativity. He said, God does not play dice. Spooky action happening at a distance. I don't believe this. In the last part of his life, he tried to find a theory which unified quantum mechanics with uh, relativity. We don't have it yet. Uh, you know, and Richard Feynman, one of the brightest minds of the 50s as well, said, I, can, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum physics. Let me try and give you a really, really uh, brief version of what quantum physics is all about. You know, there is something which is called as wave-particle duality, which means that uh, light can be a wave as well as a particle. Let's try and take a real-life example for it. Let's take humans. You know, there is an intense amount of duality in us. It's, it's kind of like what we think and what we say. If we all landed up saying what we think, there would not be enough prisons in this world. Right? And if you take this one step further, it's actually quite real in the world itself around us. If you look at two senses, a duality of humans, which is that of human triumph, in which we have massively grown or prospered in the last 50, 60 years by, uh, you know, you know, taking a simple example called education. We are now putting more people in schools. Another example of triumph is the share of people living in poverty, which has drastically come down as a part of the Millennium Goals. This is expected to be eradicated by 2030, so hopefully we will not have a concept called as poverty in the world, right? Uh, but the failure, which is the duality of humans, there is still an immense amount of inequality. You know, a very small population of the world governs a very large percent of the assets. And that's something we've not been very uh, good at, actually. 
because of capitalism, I must say. And I think somebody earlier was talking about the fact that we've plundered most of the resources on this earth, and this slide is just exemplary of that fact, that the carbon dioxide emissions have been increasing on a year-on-year -year basis. Classical human behavior, classical duality, classical wave-particle uh, duality. Something called as quantum tunneling. Uh, let me try to do simple terms, don't get bogged by it. You know, I had gone for a Michael Jackson concert once when he had come to India. I had got seats uh, or tickets for the last row. We were adventurous and we tried to go in front. There were these huge hordes of crowds, which is called an energy barrier, let's say. And we tried to cross over them, although we were, you know, so far away from the front row. But we did whatever we did. We crossed over the energy barrier and we went into the front row. That's what quantum tunneling is all about. Let's try and take some examples in real world, right? Uh, if you look at the cyber attacks which we've been having, I know all of us read of it in some form or the other, but it's a small piece of software. 300 lines of code can overcome some of the most massive firewalls in the world, and they can attack computers starting from government to uh, corporates. This is just an example of the increasing uh, ratio of attacks which are happening. Another sense is antibiotics. You know, uh, Bombay is uh, home to more than 50% of the multi-drug resistant tuberculosis cases. We did not have anything called as MDR, which was so prevalent some years ago. The viruses are becoming resistant to antibiotics, and we're living in that world. A small thing, in spite of all the progress in medicine, can get over to the other side. Uh, something called as the uncertainty principle, right? All men know they're married, they don't know their anniversaries. That's what it means, right? Uh, so it basically says that if I know uh, value A, I will never know value B with certainty. There is always going to be an innate sense of probabilistic nature in our lives. And if we go and look at that, this is something that's happening in Moore's Law. By 2025, it is predicted that we will not be able to uh, live to this law. Uh, this was made in 1959 by Gordon Moore, one of the founding engineers of Intel. And uh, we will run out of size and space. We would, things would already be so small, we will not be able to fit transistors on them. Or let's look at something like this. We've all been speaking about machines, right? We've got emotional intelligence happening, and there is this entire discussion what's happening in the globe as to what is the impact of such rapid rise of technology on humans, you know? What are the, what's going to happen to jobs? What's the future of work? What's the future of benefits? What's the future of humans? What's the future of family? All these interesting questions. It's nothing but the dualities of what could happen. Uh, something called as quantum superstition, saying anything is possible. Right? It's like when we were all children. One day we wanted to be doctors, one day we wanted to be firemen, fire people, whatever, but any, any state is possible. So that's what this uh, uh, principle allows for. But if you look at it this way, we are in a connected world. We are always connected. All things are always possible. Then we are going to enter an era whereby we are probably going to talk to our toasters. Right? These are already products which are in experiment. These are going to hit market very soon. So it's going to be a very real possibility. And we are already connected by virtue of social media. I'm sure uh, there are almost everyone here, if not everyone, has got a social media of account. And on that, whether you are texting, whether you are chatting, whether you are sharing, doesn't matter. We've become ubiquitous. So we are there in all forms which are possible in the digital world. Right? Quantum entanglement. This is an interesting one. Uh, I think uh, our Hindi film industry got the meaning of this in the 1990s. If any one of you all have seen a movie called Kishan Kanaya, uh, Anil Kapoor played the role as twins and he and his twin were separated by distances apart. One guy got hit, the other guy got hurt. Right? Uh, so that's what entanglement is all about. Right? You cannot think of two particles as different. They're all bound by the hip. Everything happens. If you want to know the state of the whole, you can't separate the particles. Right? Uh, and uh, this is so uh, evident in our real lives. If you look at the economy, global economy, because of urbanization, because of trade, we are also jointly uh, bound with each other. Something happens in the UK, Brexit happens, we lose God knows how many lakhs of crores on the stock market. Somebody in America decides to default on loans, uh, 2008, one of the biggest spirals. So this is just something what happens in the world economy. Something to test it out to say the impact of China on the world. China is slowing down. There's a real-world effect on what's happening on the entire economy of the world. And these are just some countries to give you some examples of how their growth rates are slowing down in 2016 vis-a-vis -vis 2015. It's nothing but entanglement. The whole world is connected as one. Needless to say, all of these slides, we live in this, the times of great disruption. Right? I think we should thank the American military for this. They gave us this term which is called as VUCA. And that's something what I deal with on a day, uh, daily basis, whether it's at work or whether it's outside. We live in a very, very volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment. Many, many things are changing. I think what we just saw in our journey till date is just a very, 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 very small articulation of what's really happening. What's going to happen? You know, uh, What are the choices we make? We still choose to live. We're still living our lives. We still don't know what's going to happen. There is a huge amount of uncertainty. But we are navigating through it as we go. 
how can as individuals we be a little bit more uh, proactive, if you will, to try and navigate this amount of uncertainty because if you believe it's going to remain stable state, if you think that the world is going to remain linear, it is not. We've already seen massive amounts of disruption happen. I think that's very evident with the, war, with the concept of warfare. I don't think post-1990, two countries have gone to war. It has been countries versus ideologies or countries versus anything else. Uh, so if you look at that kind of environment, what does that mean for defense forces? You have America who sent the best of armies, the best of tanks, the best of equipments. They still can't catch the terrorists who are abound all across the place. With this kind of ambiguity around, we still make our choices. And I think this was very beautifully said by Joe Epstein, who said that we don't choose which year we're born in. We can't choose our parents. We can't choose our religion. We can't choose our circumstances. But in this apparent realm of choicelessness, we choose how to live. So you all have a choice to make over here. And the choice what I have made is to try and understand this thing called uncertainty and try and create some kind of an awareness for myself and for the people I engage with so that we are able to handle it uh, comes together. Information is power. So the more you are aware, the better you can understand because it is going to be very uncertain. Our choices lead to paradigm shifts and whether we might not realize it directly, indirectly all of this is happening around us. We've actually moved from capitalism to collaboration. It was possible many times ago for, uh, you know, for islands, for islands to remain. But you can't do that anymore. People have to collaborate. People have to work together. From product to service, there's nothing finished anymore. It's always called iterative development. We are always continuing. You will never have a finished product. And that's very alarming. You know? For, imagine when you're moving from an era from a finished product to an open product, and you don't know what's going to be your next pivot. It's quite, in, uh, it's quite uncertain, both as a consumer and as a creator. We move from cash to cashless. I'm sure everyone here has a digital wallet of some sorts. If anyone uses Uber, if anyone uses any kind of uh, technology, any kind of e-commerce, I'm sure you all have uh, you know, uh, uh, used this form of uh, uh, new payments. From download to stream, I was talking to some interesting people who had streaming solutions. Now we've moved from download. Earlier we used to carry floppy disks, we used to carry USB sticks. It doesn't matter anymore because uh, you have huge amounts of storage available, but you now are moving where you're streaming content. You move from ownership to access. The very fact that you don't need to own a car, people who have two cars, people who have three cars are moving for sharing transport. It's good for the environment, it's cheaper, it helps you get on time. We're moving from real time to on demand, and we're moving to be from consumers to prosumers. Very soon we will be producing our own food. If you look at the uh, developments which are happening in 3D printing, uh, most hospitals have already started printing some kind of equipments on their own. Some hospitals in America already 3D print their own stents and give it to uh, patients at a very cheap cost. This is going to be a small glimpse into what our future is going to be like. Most of this is not stuff what's going to happen five years or ten years from now. All of this is already pervasive all around us, right? We probably don't take note of it in our lives because we are looking uh, tunnel vision, right? But if you start looking laterally and if you start looking at things around you, you will find these things. There are going to be significant drivers of change in the coming future. From the nature of work, 
to the emergence of middle class, from aging populations, from climate change, I think this has been spoken of quite often today, uh, rise in computational power, smart machines and systems. Uh, you know, we had Sneh who uh, spoke a little bit on that. We have a globally connected consumer. We have new technologies and energy which are going to continuously keep coming out of the woodworks. How is it going to impact us? You know, as humans, it can actually be quite mind-boggling to be able to even think of it, let alone navigate these entire things. And for that, we need to change our framework. We need to make the uncertain our friend. We used to run away from uncertainty. We need to embrace uncertainty and therefore deal with a framework which will help us navigate through these times. Uh, some of the skills which future citizens are going to need. So most of the people, we are very, uh, you know, especially in our country, we are very used to doing things ourselves. But there is a time where we are going to have to seek help, collaboration. We're going to have to start thinking adaptively. We will need a lot of emotional intelligence, whether it is by ourselves or whether it is machines who give that to us. Uh, whether it is cognitive flexibility. We need to be a lot more sound in our judgment and decision-making processes. And whenever you ask, you know, you will need to have a multidisciplinary approach. So all this while, our approach to careers have been, I will choose one vocation. There will be a time which is already happening that you will need to be quite well versed with many vocations in order to be able to get any tasks done.